Okay, so our recording has started and I would now like to introduce you to today's speaker. Um, her name is Elaine Mills and many of you are probably familiar um, with her. She's done many of our Friday public ed presentations um, and she's a longtime master gardener and involved in numerous parts of our organization, including the social media committee, the public ed committee, um, she's a mentoring committee. She's developed resources on our um, website, uh, including the tried and true, which she'll tell you a little bit more about. And also today helping us is Colleen Kennedy, who will be facilitating for us during the presentation. And so you will see Colleen come up. She will be um, directing your questions that you've typed into the chat to Elaine um, during specified breaks. So Elaine, can you go ahead and take it away for us? Thank you very much, Leslie. Welcome everyone to our presentation on native plants for winter interest. This is one in the series on sustainable landscaping brought to you by the Arlington Alexandria uh, Master Gardeners uh, Unit of Virginia Cooperative Extension and Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. I'll be telling you a lot more about the various services that our two organizations provide to you at the end of the talk. To give you a quick overview, I'll begin briefly by discussing benefits of using native plants. And the bulk of the talk, I'll be actually hoping to introduce you to some plants, native plants for winter interest. We'll be looking at 40 plants in all, 20 of them will be woody plants, trees, shrubs, and vines. And then we'll look at perennials, ground covers, a handful of ferns, and finish with some sedges and grasses. At the end of the talk, I'll be referring you to some helpful online resources, telling you where you might visit uh, gardens to see native plants and uh, where you might uh, actually purchase them. And as Leslie mentioned, Colleen will be uh, fielding questions in the chat box. I'll hope to be able to answer those at several points in the middle of the talk and then again at the end. Uh, briefly, before we get started, I wanted to just quickly mention some advantages of fall planting. We thought this would be helpful because if you end up being interested in some of the plants for winter interest, this is actually a good time to plant some of them. The uh, temperatures are certainly cooler, there's lower humidity now than there was in the summer, and deciduous trees and shrubs actually do best if they're planted while dormant. The soil will be moist and warm, and that allows their root systems to establish before the ground freezes. So you can actually plant up to six weeks before the ground freezes. I won't have time today to go into all the particulars, the best practices for planting trees and shrubs, but I uh, will give you information. I'll refer you to one of the presentations that I gave on shrubs. There's a section on, on best practices, and I'll tell you how to refer to that for more detailed information at the end of today's talk. So what are some benefits of using native plants? Well, first of all, they're suited to our local soil and climate, so they're more likely to do well here. And very importantly, native plants have evolved with the local fauna. That allows them to provide nectar and pollen for our endangered pollinators. They can serve as host plants for Lepidoptera. Those are butterflies, skippers, and moths. They provide fruit and seeds for wildlife and they can offer cover for a variety of animals. So uh, this is what we'll be doing as I discuss each of the selected uh, suggested native plants. Since we're talking principally about winter interest, I'll be focusing on plants that are evergreen, those that have great silhouettes and bark, and those that have interesting fruits and seeds. But as I discuss those, I'll also be pointing out some desirable characteristics, other desirable characteristics of those plants that you'll see throughout the growing season. I'll also mention their value to wildlife and talk about size and growth habit, some soil and water preferences, and another factor that's very important to many of you, deer resistance. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to to point out that we do have this handout that I hope many of you have received. Uh, it's usually sent out just before the talk begins in the morning. This list 
will give you the scientific and common names of each of the plants and give you a little bit of room to take notes. A feedback that I've received from past presentations is that people feel that it's difficult for them to, to keep up with the pace of the talk. So what I've done this time is to actually furnish direct links to fact sheets that a colleague, Master Gardener colleague, Mary Free and I have prepared. And these fact sheets are available on the Master Gardener website. I'll be giving you information on how to, to connect to that. But these links from, from the handout will take you directly to the fact sheets. So you can have very helpful information describing the plants and a lot of details more than I can even provide today about their care. So I hope that will, will help you feel more relaxed in and able to just sit back and watch the presentation in a, in a relaxed manner. So we'll begin uh, with looking at some native trees and I'm taking these in order from the tallest down to some shorter varieties. We'll begin with sweet gum, liquid dumbar, stabrasive flua. This tree is uh, especially noted for its beautiful star-shaped foliage and that looks absolutely superb in the fall. Uh, this tree provides cover and nesting sites for our wildlife. It's a fairly tall tree, 60 to 90 feet. It's fast growing and long lived and prefers uh, moist to wet conditions. What makes it interesting for winter time is uh, the fruits that develop actually turn into these woody uh, gum balls and the branches also have a corky uh, shapes al along the limbs. And those seed capsules will linger from July into March, providing an interesting winter silhouette. The, the gumballs provide food for songbirds and small mammals. Another great tree is Eastern white pine, Pinus strobus. This of course is an evergreen tree, conical to irregular in habit. It grows about 50 to 80 feet tall. It's both fast growing and long lived. Uh, this, because of its dense foliage, provides wonderful cover for wildlife. You'll be able to recognize the feathery clusters of blue-green needles. They occur in bundles of five. And the seed cones that last through the winter provide food for wildlife. One way to recognize uh, this tree is that there is one row of tiered horizontal branches that is added each year. Another evergreen, slightly shorter in height at 30 to 60 feet, is Eastern Red Cedar, Juniperus virginiana. This has a conical to columnar shape. As you can see, it's, it's much narrower in spread than, than the others. It grows in sun in dry to moist conditions. And one important thing to note is you want to avoid planting it near trees, and shrubs that can be alternate hosts for the cedar apple rust disease. Examples of those would be uh, service berry, hawthorns, any, anything in the apple family, crab apples. Uh, the, the trees will not be destroyed completely by the disease, but as you can see in this example with, with the fruit, uh, it gets an, an unsightly growth on it. Eastern red cedar has dense scale-like foliage and that provides wonderful cover for our birds. In addition, it has scented exfoliating bark that looks absolutely lovely against the winter landscape. Earlier in the season, you would notice male and female flowers. These appear on uh, separate plants because Eastern red cedar is dioecious. And on female plants, the berry-like cones will develop from the female flowers and you'll see them from July through to March. And these provide food for birds. Many of you, of course, are familiar with American holly, Alexopaca, another great evergreen with a pyramidal shape. It grows about 15 to 40 feet tall. This is a more slow growing plant. Again, another wonderful uh, plant for providing cover and nesting site for our birds. And you can use it either as a specimen as shown here or group a number of the plants to form a protective hedge. 
I learned uh, just recently that the spiny leaves actually stay on the trees for several years. This is another a dioecious plant. And so if you would like to have uh, a tree with these gorgeous berry-like droops, you'll want to have um, a male tree. This would be a female tree and you'd want to have a male tree within 200 feet. And these droops uh, will remain through the winter uh, and provide uh, food to about 18 different bird species. Uh, another shorter evergreen is Arborvitae thuya occidentalis, again with a columnar or co uh, conical shape. This is a very long lived tree. Um, it has several different forms, but a single trunk is usually preferred. One important thing to note is you'll want to protect this tree from winds, snow, and ice. This is an unfortunate uh, situation that happened with my arborvitae. Uh, I wasn't able to knock heavy snow and ice off of it after one storm, and the branches became uh, permanently disfigured. They, the whole tree really, really bent. So you want to, to be careful during uh, winter snowstorms if you do end up using arborvitae. Arborvitae has numerous cultivars. De Groot Spire is a very narrow form. Emerald is noted for its dark green foliage and yellow ribbon has a multicolored foliage. Another great tree, this time a deciduous tree with an irregular crown is river birch, Betula nigra. It grows 50 to 70 feet, and it's generally considered to be most attractive with multiple trunks. I usually see it with three trunks, again, a fast growing tree, and this will prefer moist to wet conditions. Um, I'd like to point out that the foliage of this tree uh, provides nourishment for many butterflies and moths. In the spring, you'll see these uh, little catkins that grow and the birds will eat the seeds from that. And you can use it throughout the growing season um, in, in rain gardens, for example. But the most attractive feature of this tree is its exfoliating bark. It will peel off in multiple layers, revealing different co interesting colors. And that bark is especially lovely against uh, snow in the winter time. The tree also has a beautiful winter silhouette. And uh, if you're unable to find room in your gardens for the full size species, this uh, shorter uh, cultivar would be uh, recommended to you. Little King. Another lovely deciduous tree is sourwood, Oxydendrum arboreum, another slow growing tree at 20 to 50 feet uh, in sun to part shade and moist conditions. It's uh, noted because of the valued honey that's made from the floral nectar. And these flowers actually develop into these really interesting seed capsules that are backed by long lasting brilliant fall foliage. And the seed capsules will last through the winter on the tree as you can see here, uh, providing a really interesting uh, texture to your winter landscape. Uh, moving into shorter trees, uh, American hornbeam, Carpinus caroliniana, is a deciduous globular understory tree. Uh, it's sometimes found with multiple trunks. The ones that I've seen, this one is at the US Botanic Garden, just has a single trunk. This uh, tree as an understory tree prefers part shade to shade conditions. And it uh, will favor moist, rich, acidic soil and can actually tolerate some flooding. And one uh, important thing to note if you are looking to plant some woody plants this fall is that this particular species, because of its lateral roots, actually is better to, to plant in the spring. Birds are quite often attracted to the forked branches and the dense crown of the tree. Uh, provides lots of uh, support for our wildlife. The leaves uh, provide nourishment to butterflies and birds will enjoy the nutlets, this, uh, this fruit that forms. It has attractive yellow fall foliage. And then in the winter uh, provides a beautiful winter silhouette. 
And the most uh, attractive winter feature is this uh, muscle-like uh, fluting to the bark of the trunk. Uh, another shorter tree at 20 to 35 feet is Coxspur hawthorn, Crataegus cruzgalli. This tree has horizontal thorny branches. If you're concerned about the, the thorns, you would want to cite it very, very carefully. This tree uh, is best in sunny conditions. And uh, like the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, red cedar that I mentioned earlier. This is one you're not going to want to plant near the cedar be, uh, to avoid uh, having an alternate host for that cedar apple rust disease. This tree, because of that dense uh, branching, provides cover and great nesting materials for our birds. A beautiful tree throughout the seasons. Uh, native bees will seek the, the nectar of those gorgeous white blossoms. Uh, the leaves provide nourishment to butterflies. And then in the summer and fall, you'll see the fruit referred to as palms, this gorgeous uh, orangey red fruit. And this will remain on the tree. This is the same tree that was pictured uh, in the first slide gorgeous uh, white blossoms in the spring, and then these lovely fruits that will last through the winter, providing food for birds. Another a shorter tree is Sweet Bay Magnolia, Magnolia virginiana. This in our region is a semi-evergreen tree with a rounded habit. It again is a multi-stemmed uh, variety and it's medium to fast growing. It can grow in a range of conditions from sun to part shade, but it prefers moist to wet soil. Another lovely tree through the seasons. It has large, very fragrant flowers. Uh, its leaves uh, serve as larval food for uh, the caterpillars of butterflies. And then birds will be able to enjoy the aggregate of seeds that form from the pollinated flowers in the, uh, the summer and fall. In the winter, it has a very interesting mottled bark, and this is aromatic. Colleen, do we have any questions at this point? Yes, we do, Elaine. Um, someone is getting a sugar berry free from Arlington County and wondered if it's beneficial to wildlife and if it will grow in part shade? That's a great question. And unfortunately, that's one species, I'm assuming it's a native species, that, that I am not familiar with. Um, I will be happy to do some research. And when I respond with a written document that will be posted with the recording of this presentation, I'll, I'll look into that and, and try to answer that question. Okay, I think that's it for the questions for now. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm certain that if it's a tree recommended through the county program, that it's recommended not only because of its lovely ornamental qualities, but because it will serve uh, a function to provide for our, our wildlife, either for pollinators with the blossoms or birds with the fruit. Okay. Um, that's great, thank you. Oh wait, there's one more. Can magnolia tolerate a moderately shady site? Uh, the sweet bay magnolia? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yes, I believe it, it's sun to part shade that that one can, can tolerate. Okay, thank you, Elaine. That's it for the questions. All right, let's move on looking at some native shrubs for winter interest. The first is staghorn sumac, Rus typhina, and this is actually a fairly tall shrub at 15 to 25 feet, get, getting into, into short tree height. This uh, plant can sucker and actually form pretty substantial thickets. Uh, you tend to see it in sunnier conditions, uh, dry to medium soil. And the reason it's called staghorn is because of the, the fuzzy covering that appears on the stems, resembling the, the velvet that's found on the antlers of uh, deer. This is another plant that looks really attractive through the seasons. It develops this really interesting ornamental fruit from its flower spires. And I'd like to point out uh, that it can be used, uh, the, the 
the covering on this can be used uh, to make a, a lemonade. And if you watch one of our presentations on foraging, there's an interesting discussion and recipe for, for making that lemonade. The, the covering is also what's used uh, for the spice sumac that's used in Middle Eastern cooking. In the fall, you'll see this absolutely spectacular foliage color. And then the fruits will, will dry, but, uh, but linger in these interesting branches for winter interest. Witch hazel is a, a deciduous, low branching shrub. It's multi-stemmed and again, like the sumac, can uh, uh, form colonies. Uh, the leaves provide nourishment to moth species, and it has an, an attractive fall foliage. Now, the very interesting thing about this plant is that it actually flowers late in the winter into the fall. It has these lovely ribbon-like yellow flowers. Some of the, the non-native witch hazels will have a brighter uh, red or, or orange flower, but the native one has this uh, yellow ribbon-like uh, flower. Another lovely shrub, mountain laurel, Calmia latifolia, is evergreen, it has a rounded habit, and it uh, is an understory plant, so it will grow in, in part shade. It's going to prefer uh, acidic soil. It's referred to as an ericaceous plant, uh, similar to the azaleas and the rhododendrons. It really prefers much more acidic soil. We usually think of mountain laurel as a plant of interest in the springtime when these lovely flowers are in bloom. Uh, they have uh, really interesting uh, anthers that are fastened into the uh, petal of, of the plant. And when bumblebees or other pollinators land on the flower, these are spring loaded and they will release very quickly and uh, propel pollen onto the backs of, of our pollinating insects. These flowers uh, bloom from May to July. Then they will uh, form these interesting persisting fruits. And it's these fruits along with the shiny evergreen leaves and the gnarled trunks with red, ground, red brown bark that uh, provide winter interest in this particular plant. Uh, another shrub, southern bayberry, also referred to as wax myrtle, uh, now goes by the scientific name Morella serifera. It was originally designated as Myrica. This is an evergreen plant with a, an irregular shape, about 10 to 15 feet tall. It's very dense branching, and interestingly, it's a nitrogen fixing plant. All of the parts of this are aromatic. Uh, I tend to think of this as a coastal plant because it's tolerant of wind and salt that you would find at the beach. It's also tolerant of drought and deer. Uh, you'll see buds uh, in the wintertime, buds in, in February. Uh, they have a waxy coating on them and that's what's used in making the bayberry candles. Uh, fruits that uh, form in the summer will actually persist through the winter. And as I mentioned, it has aromatic evergreen leaves. Another of the ericaceous uh, acid loving plants is Rose Bay Rhododendron, Rhododendron maximum, an evergreen tree, uh, shrub rather, uh, with an upright, rather loose habit. Uh, it reaches about five to 15 feet in height. It's multi-stemmed and because it grows in the understory of forests, it's going to prefer part shade to shade conditions and rich moist soil. In the summertime, it has huge, lovely, large showy clusters of flowers from June to July. And these attract a wide variety of pollinators, including uh, lovely butterflies. It has strap-like evergreen leaves and uh, lingering seed clusters. So it has quite an architectural presence in the forests or gardens uh, throughout the winter. A shorter shrub is sweet pepper bush, Clethra alnifolia. This one is deciduous with an upright to rounded habit. 
it reaches about six to 12 feet in height and it can sucker to form colonies. This particular shrub can uh, grow well in a range of conditions from sun to shade, but it's really going to prefer uh, moister, wetter soil. Multiple cultivars of this particular shrub are available. Hummingbird is a very diminutive white flowered variety and ruby spice is noted for these beautiful uh, pink flowers. Both of them are very attractive to pollinators as you can see here. Very fragrant flowers. Sweet pepper bush has a, a brilliant yellow fall foliage and then the flowers, those prominent flower spires will linger on through the winter time. They will provide food to the birds and interesting textural interest throughout the winter time in your garden. An another shrub that many of you may be familiar with but may not know that it's a native is red twig dogwood, Cornus sericea. This is a deciduous upright plant of about six to 10 feet. It's very rapid growing and it's a multi-stemmed plant. The Baileyi cultivar is non-suckering if you prefer to have one distinct specimen species. It grows in sun to part shade and it's another plant that prefers uh, moist to wet conditions. It actually becomes somewhat stressed in, in hot summers. This plant is very attractive throughout the growing season. It has dark uh, leaves and red twigs early in the year. Then flowers will form in May and fruit, this white fruit in the summertime. But it really becomes spectacular in the winter. The stems will turn a bright red and uh, the young stems actually have the best color. So what we recommend if you decide to grow this plant is to do what our uh, master gardener coordinators at uh, Glen Carlin Garden do. You want to actually remove maybe 20 to 25% of the plant. You want to prune that out in the late winter, very, very early spring, maybe March and you're going to want to cut out the older canes. Those are the ones that are going to, to have more of a brown color. By doing that, you're going to encourage the, the growth of, of younger stems and those are the ones that are the brighter red color. If you're looking for a great replacement for uh, boxwood, this native shrub inkberry, Ilex glabra, is an evergreen with a rounded to spreading habit. Uh, different cultivars grow anywhere from six to 10 feet and you can get uh, distinct species or uh, forms that sucker to form colonies. Like some of the other plants I've mentioned, this one is dioecious. That means that there are separate male and female plants. It grows in sun to part shade and moist to wet conditions. In the spring, it has uh, very small, delicate white flowers. We don't tend to notice them that much, but they're very attractive to the pollinators. And when the, the uh, flowers are pollinated, they form this lovely dark fruit that provides uh, food for about 15 bird species. The foliage is uh, fairly dense and it can provide cover for birds and looks very attractive with snow in the winter landscape. Common nine bark, Physocarpus of Pulifolius, is another of my favorites. Uh, it's deciduous with a, a rounded overall form and it has multi-stemmed arching branches and they arch out somewhat like forsythia does. This grows in sun to part shade conditions. And uh, these lovely flower clusters, dense, tight, uh, packed flower clusters will form uh, just profusely on the plant in May and they attract numerous pollinators. There are multiple uh, cultivars of this plant available. Diabolo has this darker foliage and it tends to be, I believe, a, a shorter height. Amber Jubilee is a really attractive one with uh, orangey yellow foliage. Summer Wine is a very popular cultivar. After the flowers fade, they form this abundant summer fruit that's enjoyed by birds. 
then this will turn uh, dark. The, the dried fruit capsules will actually remain on the plant providing interest in the winter. And when the leaves drop, uh, mature uh, shrubs will show this really interesting exfoliating bark. Another of my favorites, red chokeberry, Aronia arbutifolia, is a deciduous plant with a very upright habit. Uh, it can sucker to form colonies, as you see here, a really dense growth as it spreads. It grows in sun to part shade and likes moist conditions. And these are what the flowers look like in April. In the fall, it takes on an absolutely brilliant color, and this makes it an excellent substitute for invasive burning bush. Uh, fruit will form from the pollinated flowers uh, late in the summer, and this persists well into the winter, uh, providing food for birds and uh, just interesting winter interest with uh, ice and snow. Oak leaf hydrangea. Hydrangea quercifolia is a plant that I tend to see more uh, in the general horticulture trade. Uh, it's actually native to the southeast, but it does quite well here. It's a deciduous plant with a, a broad upright habit. It reaches about six to eight feet high. Uh, this is a multi-stemmed suckering plant, and it's an understoring plant in the forest, so it grows in uh, part shade. It has these huge uh, flower spires from May to July. Uh, a number of the flowers, the very showy ones, are actually sterile flowers, but the little flowers hidden underneath here are the fertile flowers that are going to attract the pollinators. And the flower spires will turn from pink to tan as they age. The, uh, the dried flowers continue to provide interest and they look really nice against the spectacular full foliage that persists uh, into the winter. And this is another type of shrub that has really interesting exfoliating stems. Winterberry, Ilex verticillata, is um, a native holly. This particular one is deciduous and it has an upright habit. Uh, the straight species reaches 6 to 12 feet, and some of the cultivars are available in shorter heights. It's multi-stemmed, and like some of the other plants I've mentioned, is dioecious, has separate male and female plants. It grows in sun to part shade and tends to like a moister soil. This particular cultivar that I'm showing here is winter red. Uh, the important thing for you to do is to get a pair, at least uh, one pair of male and female cultivars that are going to have the same bloom time. They don't need to be planted side by side as they are here, at least within 40 feet of each other. If you want to have uh, a series of plants, you can get mostly females and one male can service up to 10 female shrubs. Uh, this particular pairing with the, with the red fruit is Red Sprite and uh, its male partner is Jim Dandy. If you like uh, orange variety of fruit, this is winter gold, the female uh, winter gold, and that is paired with Southern Gentleman. And this is how beautiful those two uh, shrubs look all the way through the winter time. This is in the forested area at um, Green Spring, and this is at the US uh, Botanic Garden. A uh, winterberry is outstanding because it provides fruit, uh, it's an important fruit uh, food source for 48 different species of birds. Another lovely fruiting shrub is American Beautyberry, Calicarpa Americana. This particular shrub is deciduous, another one with a vase sh shape and arching branches in that forsythia type habit. Uh, it's a little bit shorter at three to six feet, very fast growing and it grows in sun to part shade. It has these uh, clusters of lavender flowers that completely encircle the stems uh, from June to August. This is unlike the, the non-native uh, Japanese beauty berry where the flowers just form in flatter sprays along the stems. These flowers are going to be very attractive to our native bees and butterflies. 
And then these brilliant droops, uh, absolutely gorgeous uh, berries uh, form uh, in, in the fall. And those will last on the shrub into the winter and are enjoyed by over 40 species of songbirds, an important food source for them. Uh, a different type of shrub to give you a little bit of variety is a uh, swamp rose, Rosa palustris. Uh, this is a deciduous upright shrub with an arching habit that is another one that can spread slowly by suckers. This one is best grown in sun to provide disease resistance and it will grow in wet conditions and actually tolerate seasonal flooding. The great thing about choosing a native rose is that it's not going to be susceptible to the many diseases and pests of the popular hybrid roses. And it's more deer resistant than the non-natives as well. It has compound foliage and these large uh, flowers from May to June. Uh, rose hips uh, that you are probably familiar with will form and the inner seeds are eaten by birds. The uh, dried and lingering rose hips are really attractive against the reddish twigs uh, through the winter time. A shrub that you may not be so familiar with is coastal dog hobble, Leucothui axillaris. This is an evergreen shrub uh, with a vase shape and a fountaining arching branches, uh, shorter than the others I've discussed so far at about two to uh, four feet high. It's another understory shrub, so it does well in part shade. You want to cite this one a little more carefully because it doesn't tolerate either drought or drying winds. It has these really interesting heather-like flowers. They have kind of an urn shape and they will uh, form in the spring. Then the uh, fruits that are formed from the pollinated flowers will linger on through the winter, set against this glossy foliage that turns uh, red, green, and, and purple. And then uh, in uh, late winter, these uh, new flower buds, really interesting flower buds will form. A plant that many may not even realize is uh, a shrub is common yucca. Yucca filamentosa. This is ex actually a stemless shrub. It's evergreen and a very erect. It has uh, spinal, uh, excuse me, sword shaped uh, rosette of leaves at the base, and they have these curly threads leading to the name filamentosa. Uh, they will send up this amazingly tall uh, flower stalk that can reach uh, eight feet that's very attractive to uh, moth pollinators. And it can actually slowly colonize. There'll be little basal offsets from, uh, from the base of the plant. This is a plant you'll definitely want to plant uh, in uh, dry and sunny conditions, although it can uh, tolerate uh, part shade. So this is a plant that has more of a, of a desert appearance, but it is native to this part of the country. There are multiple uh, very interesting cultivars that are available. Two that I've noticed uh, prominently in local public gardens are Color Guard and Bright Edge. There are seed pods that will form from that tall flowering stalk that uh, give interest in the fall. And uh, this is what the straight species looks like, just a uh, absolutely retaining its architectural structure in the garden through uh, winter into the spring. And uh, the last of our uh, native shrubs is actually a cultivar of the American holly tree that we spoke about earlier. This is Ilex opaca Maryland dwarf. It uh, provides uh, an excellent ground cover, uh, only about three feet high, but spreading to about 10 feet wide. Uh, it's going to prefer moist acidic soil and it has all the features of the tree, the same uh, long lasting evergreen foliage and the same beautiful berries. Moving on to the last of our woody plants, we'll look quickly at a couple of vines. Uh, native trumpet honeysuckle, Lonicera sempervirens, is a great substitute for the invasive Japanese honeysuckle. Uh, 
I found that this plant tends to actually be semi evergreen. Uh, my plants will last on into the winter. Uh, I use them twining uh, against an arbor. Uh, and I've had flowers form uh, as late as December. They can flower until frost. And then the fruit that forms uh, begins in August. And again, uh, like the leaves can linger on the, the plant until March. Carolina jessamine, Gelsemium sempervirens is an evergreen twining a vine. It reaches about 10 to 20 feet and it does its best flowering in the sun. It has these fragrant flowers that will actually form in late winter or early spring. But over the winter, when you don't see the flowers, the foliage takes on a really attractive patina. Cross vine, Bignonia capriolata is a semi-evergreen climbing vine, and it clings by means of some clawed tendrils. It can grow quite uh, extensively from 30 to 45 feet, and you may want to cut any root suckers to control its growth. Uh, it tolerates uh, drought and uh, brief flooding, so can, can uh, withstand a variety of growing conditions. And this is what the lovely uh, trumpet-shaped flowers look like from May to June, and they're going to attract pollinators as well as hummingbirds. Any more questions here, Colleen? Uh, we have a ton of questions here. A couple were left over from the tree section, so I'm going to start with those. Um, one person asked if you would again review um, cedar rust considerations, where to place your tree and where not to place it. Uh, unfortunately, cedar rust disease is, is highly prevalent in our area because of how many um, junipers we have. We not only have the, uh, the popular red cedar tree, but the low growing ground covers, the juniper spreading ground covers um, can also be hosts for that plant. And those are fairly prevalent. Uh, if I recall correctly from uh, a presentation that Amy Crumpton gave on trees. If these, if these uh, alternate hosts are planted within even several hundred feet of each other, they, they can affect each other. So it's um, plants in, in that cedar family uh, as, far as, as far as the evergreens grow, whether it's trees or ground covers, and then plants like, uh, like, uh, like apples, crab apples, service berry and hawthorns and any of the plants in in that rose family they uh the the evergreens will have a a strange uh, growth a kind of an orange growth that forms on them and then the the fruiting trees will will have that uh dangly orange growth uh that forms on on the berries um it, which makes them rather unsightly. As I said, it doesn't really kill the plants, but, but it makes them less attractive. Thanks, Elaine. Um, someone has a service berry that is affected by cedar rust. Is there any way to cure it or get rid of it? it there's, no, there's no cure that I'm aware of for that. Um, just try to enjoy the plant as much as you can. Maybe, I, I don't know if you can possibly harvest the berries before any rust forms on them, if you, ha if you have seen that in the past. Okay, um, a couple of questions on witch hazel. Um, can you go over again how you should cite it? Uh, witch hazel, well, witch hazel in its natural habitat is an understory plant. So it will, it will do well in, in part shade uh, con conditions. Okay, and uh, would you recommend a dwarf witch hazel to replace azaleas? Uh, I'm not aware of any dwarf varieties uh, for for the native uh, witch hazel. There, there may be some that many of the cultivars that are widely available of witch hazel are in fact uh, non-native uh, shrubs. They, there are many of them. You'll see a great many of them at Green Spring Gardens, which is a, is a great center, uh, highly regarded for its huge uh, witch hazel collection. And they have plants that are uh, come in a variety of, of heights. 
Um, okay. Thank you. Um, another participant said that their witch hazel never drops its leaves. Why would that be? Hmm. Okay. Well, maybe just with the milder, milder growing season, it, it retains them. I would, I would expect that the, that the leaves would eventually drop in the spring and that new ones would, would leaf out. Uh, and, and this is a native witch hazel? Uh, they didn't say actually. Okay. So I guess you might want to look at the, at the label if you can remember what that plant was. There might be something different about it if it's uh, one of the ones from, uh, from Japan or uh, China. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned Southern Bayberry. Is Northern Bayberry also a reasonable uh, shrub? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And do they do bayberries need uh, male and female plants? Uh, I don't believe that those do. I don't believe they're dioecious. Okay. Um, can you plant a red twig dogwood in full shade? Uh, we have it in fairly shady conditions at the Glen Carlin Garden. Um, another location I've seen it at. Is, uh, is in a much more open location at the Walter Reed Community Center in, in Arlington. Um, I, I think some of the plants tend to flower a little bit better if, if they get a certain amount of sun. Okay, that makes sense. Um, another participant has a red twig dogwood that has never fruited. Uh, any ideas why? Uh, I. I don't know if the if I wonder if it's flat if it has has it flowered it I guess if you are some of it might have to do with it with the pruning if it's pruned back severely some of the new uh, twigs may not put out flowers and therefore the flowers wouldn't be pollinated and there, therefore it wouldn't uh, fruit that that could be one explanation. Okay. That makes uh, if, if for some reason the flowers, it, it did flower, but the flowers weren't pollinated uh, sufficiently, it might not form fruit. Okay. Um, someone else asked about pruning shrubs to meet their HOA requirements. Are there any good rules for pruning shrubs? You know what? We have some excellent uh, recordings, uh, some excellent presentations specifically on pruning. And uh, I will refer you to, to uh, those at the end. Uh, if you haven't seen it already, you might also want to look at a recording that I made on, it, the, the title is Overused Foundation Plants and uh, Native Alternatives. And that could give some suggestions of plants that you aren't going to have to be pruning so drastically in order to help them retain the, the proper height. You can choose plants, right plant, right place. Choose a plant that's going to fit your conditions rather than trying to constantly be pruning it down to keep it within bounds. So I'll uh, try to talk about those two talks at the, uh, at the end when I discuss resources, online resources. Okay, great. Um, can you plant yucca in full shade? I have actually seen it uh, when I visited the, uh, the North Carolina Arboretum, I saw it in a fairly shady location. I think, I mean, it, it really is a sun-loving plant. And I think taking it to part shade would maybe be the extent of, of shade that I would provide. I, I don't know that it's going to flower as well if you have it in a full shade condition. Okay. Um... Do you have any idea which of these shrubs are toxic to dogs or not toxic? I do not know that. Okay. Um, I, I know that, that some shrubs can be toxic to animals in general. And this could be another question I could look into, do a little bit of research and, and post the answer to that when the recording is posted. Okay, thanks Elaine. Um, someone else mentioned uh, the idea of growing the vines you mentioned in pots in case they're uh, kind of aggressive. Is that a good idea? That can be a good idea. I actually discussed that in a, a talk I gave on small space gardening for pollinators. 
putting plants in pots can be a, a great way to control them. If, if you have a, a rather rambunctious grass, for example, that's a way to, to corral that. Um, so you can have a pot and you could actually have uh, place it right in front of an arbor and, and let the vine grow up the arbor. Okay, that sounds good. Um, should shrubs be transplanted when all the leaves are gone or? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the dormant period, so that's um, generally when the des this deciduous trees and shrubs are going to be losing their leaves. That's, that's really an ideal time for them. The evergreens, on the other hand, I understand, actually do better if you plant them uh, in the spring. You want to get them in the ground before the heat of summer so that they can really uh, get their root systems established. But this, this right now is a good time for planting the, uh, the deciduous trees and shrubs, except for the, the one, the, the American uh, hornbeam that I, that I mentioned, that, that because of its particular root growth does better in the spring. Okay, um, are there any native clematis plants? There are, there is. Um, that one is Virgin's Bower, uh, Clematis virginiana, a, a lovely uh, native shrub. That one, uh, excuse me, native vine. That one I, I didn't mention because it didn't have particular winter interest, but it's lovely with its flowers, great pollinator magnet, and a wonderful substitute for the invasive sweet uh, autumn uh, clematis. Okay, and finally, the last question, does yucca bloom on the same plant each year or send out shoots to bloom again? It will send up a flower shoot from the main basal rosette. Smaller rosettes, little offshoots will form away from, from that main rosette. You can actually separate them out and uh, create another whole plant. And then those plants, when they are mature, they will send up their own flower stalks. Okay, and uh, sorry if a last one came in. Do you think that since next year is supposed to be a cicada year, people should hold off planting new trees and shrubs? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I can't remember whether um, Amy discussed that when she talked about uh, planting trees. That could be something to, to consider. Um, okay. Try to do a little more research into that as well. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we'll talk next about perennials. And this is a category of plants that most of you probably don't think of uh, particularly as uh, providing winter interest. Um, we think of them as, as growing uh, through the spring and summer and then dying back and we won't see them again until next spring. But I'm hoping to show you that they can uh, serve uh, several functions in the winter garden. Uh, the first example is purple cone flower, Echinacea purpurea. This um, is actually native to the Midwest, but it does extremely well here. And because it is such a pollinator magnet, we uh, master gardeners really highly recommend it. The, the important thing to note is that those prominent cones in the center of those compound flowers, after the ray flowers have faded away, those bright colored petals, they form these uh, seed heads. And in the fall, those flower cones are going to produce seed that are going to support our goldfinches, highly uh, popular with them. But if you leave those seed heads, they have a, a lovely ornamental effect uh, going on into the winter months. Uh, another example is coastal joe pie weed, Eutrochium dubium. This is a tall, upright, herbaceous plant uh, with unbranched stems, about two to four feet high. And the little joe is a, a shorter cultivar of, of that plant. This plant uh, tends to grow in moist to wet conditions, a great uh, choice for the center, the large central uh, part of a rain garden, for example. Um, provides wonderful support to our wildlife throughout the growing season. Uh, it's a larval host for moths 
and uh, these huge flower domes provide easy access for numerous pollinators, um, bees and flies of many kinds, as well as, as butterflies. But as the fall and winter come, you can actually retain the, uh, the flower stalks. Seed heads will form, and these will provide some great overwintering food for the birds, as well as architectural interest after the seeds have actually been eaten. One other really important thing to note is that if you retain the stems, the, the large stems of this plant, that provides an overwintering location for uh, the larvae of some of our, of our native bees. Uh, any native plant that has um, a stem, pencil size or larger, and these are, are considerably larger than pencil size, will be a great overwintering uh, location. Uh, New York ironweed, Vernonia nove boracensis, another tall upright plant. This one can grow as tall as eight feet tall and has several stems from a single crown. Uh, another one that likes the moist to wet conditions has these absolutely spectacular red violet flowers that are highly attractive to pollinators. Then uh, in the fall and lingering on into the winter, these seed clusters will form and they will provide food for our birds uh, as well as ornamental interest. Here's a plant that we have just introduced recently at Glen Carlin Garden, uh, one that you may not be familiar with. This is Rattlesnake Master, Eryngium yesifolium. It's a tall upright plant uh, with a basal rosette that's not unlike that of the yucca with these very spiny leaves. It will also send up a flower stalk with these interesting globular flowers. Like the yucca, it uh, does best in very sunny conditions, dry conditions, and will actually tolerate drought and dry rocky soil. And then it really has uh, an interesting textural and architectural presence in your garden through the growing season. This is what it looks like in summer, then fall and winter as the, uh, the seed heads dry. We'll quickly look at some ground covers. First is partridge berry, Michella repens. This is a low mat forming evergreen shrub, only, excuse me, ground cover, only about four inches high. It's fairly slow to establish. You'll want to plant it away from any uh, plants that would compete with it. But uh, once it becomes established, it can, can form quite a, a dense mat. Uh, it's a forest plant, so it tends to like the part shade to shade conditions in acidic soil. It has charming paired uh, white blossoms in the spring. You can see the paired buds right here. And they actually form, they, the pollinated flowers actually form jointly uh, a single bright red fruit that will uh, last into the winter. Another lovely ground cover is Allegheny Spurge, Pachysandra procumbens. This is a clumping evergreen that grows about six to 10 inches high and will spread slowly by rhizomes. Uh, another forest plant, so prefers those part shade to shade conditions. It has very interesting foliage that changes through the seasons. The new uh, shoots come up with uh, almost a, a bright lime green color, these little whorls. The new leaves, once they unfurl, have uh, a mottled uh, texture to them and they uh, perfectly set off these lovely fragrant pink and, and white blossoms in the spring. And then as the leaves mature, they take on this solid uh, green color. This, uh, because uh, of its evergreen quality, makes it an excellent replacement for multiple um, invasive ground covers that are so popular. Uh, uh, <clears throat> English ivy, vinca, liriope. Another attractive ground cover is wild pink. 
Silene Caroliniana. It's mostly uh, noted because of these lovely flowers. Uh, they are uh, an early nectar source for native bees and, and hummingbirds. But what makes it important in the winter landscape is that it is evergreen and it spreads from stolons, these ground level stems. So it can provide a continuous uh, edging for your garden beds through the winter. Uh, another lovely ground cover is hairy alum root, Heucherovolosa. It's a clumping semi evergreen plant about six to 12 inches high, and it's going to spread from ground level stems. It grows in a variety of conditions from sun to full shade, but you want to be careful it's intolerant of drought, so you need to, to keep it moist through the growing season. It has uh, these really attractive uh, leaves and airy uh, flower panicles that are sent up in the summer. The uh, the flowers of the autumn bride cultivar are especially attractive, and those will last all the way through uh, providing interest through into the spring. Uh, another ground cover that I've used extens extensively in my garden, this is uh, one of my front garden beds right here, is foxglove beard tongue, Penstemon digitalis, and uh, I make a special use of uh, hu the Husker Red cultivar. This is an upright plant and it has evergreen basal leaves. It uh, in the spring will send up these lovely tall uh, flower spires, maybe uh, oh, two or three feet high. And they have tubular flowers that last uh, about a month that are very attractive to a variety of pollinators. They will form these really interesting seed heads and you can uh, allow these to, to linger on through the winter for textural interest. The plant will self seed, it will spread through the garden when, uh, when these seed heads open up. It also, like, like the yucca, can uh, grow vegetatively and will have offsets from a, a large central basal rosette. If you decide that you don't want it to self-seed um, and you no longer find uh, the seed heads attractive, you can simply trim them down, but this will uh, form an attractive winter ground cover. Another uh, well-liked ground cover is golden ragwort. Uh, Pacara aurea, and this is highly recommended by our local Audubon at Home program as a great replacement for English ivy. It does well in a huge uh, set of conditions, sun, part shade, shade, uh, on flat surfaces, uh, especially good for controlling erosion on uh, slopes. In the spring, it sends up these lovely uh, flower stalks, they're about 18 inches high and they're topped by tiny yellow daisy-like flowers that are very popular with the pollinators. Uh, when these die down, you can cut them back and uh, what remains are these glossy basal leaves and they're clump forming and they also spread by stolons and so they can perform quite, uh, can form quite a, a dense luxuriant ground cover. They do spread if you decide that you don't want them to move into a certain area. Because they're, they're spreading above ground, I find them very easy to control. We'll quickly take a look at some ferns. The first, uh, appropriately enough, is Christmas fern, Polystichum acrosticoides. This is a clump forming evergreen fern. The ferns grow in kind of a cascading form uh, and the clumps will increase in size over time. They're uh, about six to 24 inches in height. And because it's a, a native forest species, it's going to prefer part shade to shade conditions. It has these silvery scaled fiddle heads uh, in the spring and then uh, you'll see these dark leathery fronds and uh, the sori, the spore bearing structures will appear on the, the top portion 
of the frond. It has very uh, leathery fronds with these uh, small pinnae, the little, the little leaflets of the fronds, and they uh, are thought by some to, uh, to resemble Christmas stockings. This is another of my favorite ferns, marginal wood fern, Dropterus marginalis. This is a clump forming fern that has a vase shape and it's uh, taller than the Christmas fern. It reaches heights of about 18 to 24 inches high and wide. Again, it prefers uh, part shade to shade conditions in moist acidic soil and it will actually tolerate drought. My uh, forested area is, is rather dry. It will tolerate drought once it's established. This one again has the uh, sorry, the spore bearing structures on the back and they uh, are lined up in rows on the, the edges of the uh, reverse side of the leaflets, the pinnae. Uh, the third fern, this one is not an evergreen fern, ostrich fern, Matuchia strothiopterus. This is a clumping, upright, arching fern, quite a bit larger than the others. It can reach heights of uh, six feet and spread five to eight feet. Uh, again, it prefers part shade to shade conditions and it likes um, uh, actually wet soil. This uh, is the one type of fern that has edible fiddleheads in the early spring. And as the um, the sterile fronds leaf out, they are a beautiful a backdrop for uh, spring ephemerals and, and bulbs. In the summer, these very interesting fertile fronds will form. They will dry and uh, look like this, uh, uh, like the, the ostrich plumes, and they will linger through the winter forming uh, uh, serving a really great architectural interest. And then the spores from, from those fertile fronds won't actually be released until the following spring. We'll quickly look at some sedges and grasses. Uh, this is one of my favorite sedges, plantain leaf sedge, Carex plantagenea. This I feel is the most ornamental of the sedges. It has wide um, crickly uh, leaves that uh, strap like leaves that are maybe about an inch wide. And uh, because of that crinkly surface, they're sometimes referred to as seersucker sedge. In the spring, they send up these very interesting inflorescences and they're on striped uh, stems that alternate in maroon and green in color. Um, it tends to like moist conditions, but I've found that once it becomes established, it can actually handle some dry shade. Uh, as I said, it's, it's evergreen and it's a great replacement, has very much the same habit as the invasive liriope. Quickly looking at some grasses, uh, the first is Indian grass, Sorgastrum newtons. This is a warm season grass. Uh, grasses, the ornamental native grasses, uh, similar to turf grasses, uh, are divided into the warm season and the cool season grasses. The warm season grasses are going to be a little slow to start developing in the spring. Then they will really take off with their growth in the summer and uh, will be most attractive in the fall. And then because they remain upright, there'll be a lingering architectural presence in the garden through the winter time. This is the first um, native grass that really caught my attention. Uh, just absolutely spectacular in the uh, late afternoon sunlight. This picture was taken uh, in the meadow at Longwood Gardens up in Pennsylvania. It, it maintains this upright habit through the winter. Uh, another tall grass is switchgrass, Panicum virgata. This is a clumping grass, another warm season grass, and it's uh, rather vase shaped in form. It reaches about three to six feet in height and tends to prefer sun. Uh, a lot of these native grasses are really uh, prairie grasses. They, they grew in sunnier, drier conditions. And the more shade they have and the more moisture and richness to the soil, the more they would tend to flop. So you really want to, to provide the, the, uh, the leaner, less rich uh, soil and the dr somewhat drier soil for them. 
This one uh, has very airy seed heads with uh, little tiny pink flowers uh, in the summertime. And then those will turn this tawny color in the fall and uh, persist on into the winter time. Uh, this is what the straight species looks like, uh, this straight green. Uh, this picture was taken uh, using the plants uh, as a border at uh, the U.S. Botanic Garden, but there are many, many cultivars of this plant. This one is pretty popular in the general horticulture trade. Uh, one example that's somewhat shorter and has uh, interesting maroon colored foliage in the fall is Shenandoah, and North Wind is a really attractive, taller uh, plant, really great architectural presence through the fall and winter. River oats, Chasmanthium latifolium, is a clumping cool season grass. This will be a grass that will put on its burst of growth in the springtime. This one of all the grasses that I'm talking about is certainly the most rambunctious. It can spread both by self seeding and via rhizomes. And it's one that I've seen uh, corralled by actually planting it in containers. They, they do that at, um, at meadowlark gardens. This one grows in the sun and can actually tolerate a, a certain amount of shade in moist to wet conditions. The interesting thing about this grass is how the seed heads change through the seasons. They're absolutely gorgeous, backlit by the sun when they first develop um, in uh, July and August. Then they'll begin to take on this pink color as the uh, summer moves on. They will turn uh, this dark tawny color and, and actually remain as quite a presence through the winter time. You can use these um, as really attractive additions to cut flower arrangements. This particular grass, a uh, prairie drop seed, Sporobolus heterolepis, is actually native to the Midwestern prairies, but it does well here. I've seen it uh, used very effectively. This particular planting is at Brookside Gardens in uh, Maryland. So I, I thought I would mention it here. Uh, it also is noted for retaining its shape. It, it doesn't become bedraggled through the winter. Um, this is a clumping warm season grass, and it's quite a tough species. It will, will last, uh, last you well through the whole year, and it has these very fragrant uh, seed clusters that uh, provide winter interest. Pink muley grass, Muellenbergia capillaris, is a clumping, very rounded grass, about two to three feet high and wide. This one looks absolutely spectacular planted in the sun with these glowing uh, flower heads that look almost like uh, children's sparklers. This is uh, quite a drought tolerant plant and you want to avoid any location where it would become bogged down with wetness in the winter time. Otherwise, it's a, a tough and adaptable plant. And the, uh, the seed plumes will actually persist through the winter in this tan color. And our final plant uh, for today is little blue stem, Schizocarium scoparium, another of the clumping warm season grasses, one of those that, that really was quite prominent uh, along with Indian grass and switchgrass in our native tall grass prairies. This one is shorter than the others. It grows only about four feet high. Uh, definitely prefers the sun and dry conditions and is quite doubt tolerant. It uh, provides lots of support for our wildlife. It is a host to skippers and uh, the, the dense uh, clusters of uh, foliage will provide cover for wildlife. It has these lovely uh, glowing silvery white seed heads that form in the fall. And then the foliage will turn from this beautiful blue green to a kind of a tawny color. And this will persist in the winter. In fact, this picture right here was taken in my garden in the dead of winter. Let me quickly give you some important information about uh, the, the services that both um, Virginia Tech and Master Gardeners can, uh, can provide for you. Uh, 
our particular unit, the Arlington Alexandria unit of Virginia Cooperative Extension has been uh, providing public education on scientific based information uh, from our land grant colleges, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University since 1985. And we do that in a number of ways. As Leslie mentioned, we have a functioning help desk. Normally you would be able to, to visit the help desk at our Fairlington headquarters, but that's closed right now. But please feel free to send email messages, text and photographs if you wish to this address, MG, for Master Gardener, A-R-L for Alexandria, A-L-E-X, excuse me, M-G for Master Gardener, A-R-L for Arlington, A-L-E-X for Alexandria at gmail.com. Now, in addition to the, the help desk, we generally have plant clinics throughout the year. These uh, are either at Arlington Central Library or the many, uh, many farmers markets throughout the region. Unfortunately, these aren't functioning right, uh, at the moment, but please feel free to contact the help desk for support. We have a number of demonstration gardens. I'll talk a little bit about, about those in a moment, as well as uh, classes. Uh, our unit of uh, VCE is supported by Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, which is a nonprofit organization. And Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia uh, do a lot of social outreach. We have a website, uh, mgnv.org, that Leslie mentioned. Uh, I also do a lot of uh, Facebook posts uh, once a week on native plants. There are uh, twice daily posts uh, that are up uh, on a wide variety of other gardening topics. And we also have Instagram and, and Twitter accounts that you can visit. For more information on native plants, these are the fact sheets that I referred to uh, that you'll be taken to if you follow the links from my handout. If you wanted to go directly from the website, you would go to the plants menu and then the pull down is tried and true native plants for the mid Atlantic. Then you could look at a wide variety of plants, trees, shrubs, ground covers, ferns, all the different categories are included. And this is what the, the uh, fact sheets look like. This is an example for winterberry holly. So you can see all the facts on the height, the spread, um, different characteristics, various attributes such as their tolerances to, to drought, flooding, um, deer, a black walnut. Uh, we also talk about the, the services they provide to wildlife and lots of growing and maintenance tips. Uh, I mentioned that, that we have recordings of the different uh, public ed presentations that we give. And if you would like to see those, go to our website, mgnv.org. And here you would go to the public education tab and arrow down to Master Gardener's uh, <coughs> virtual classroom. That's divided, subdivided into three sections. One has best management practices, one has um, urban agriculture, and the, the section that, that uh, I've been talking about is the sustainable landscaping section. So some of the talks that I've given, the one that I mentioned where I talked about uh, growing things in pots, uh, is the small space gardening for pollinators. This is the talk that I gave on uh, foundation plants, and if you go to 46 minutes into the talk, if you just want to see the section on best practices for planting woody plants, uh, you can, can go to that recording and, and get that helpful information. If you'd like to see native plants, please visit our Master Gardener demonstration gardens. We have five of them. Uh, the fifth one is a vegetable garden, so it wouldn't have the plants I've been discussing. But in Alexandria, we have Simpson Gardens. In Central Arlington, Glen Carlin Library Garden, uh, where I volunteer as a co-coordinator, we have lots of uh, native plants, including uh, those, especially uh, its support of monarchs at that garden. And then at Bonaire Garden uh, in, in Arlington, both a shade garden and a sunny garden. And you might also want to visit these various public gardens uh, 
all the pictures that I've taken uh, in the talk for today were either taken at these gardens, at our master gardener demonstration gardens or in my own garden. And finally, for information on where to buy native plants, please see the Plant Nova Natives website. They have a list of year-round uh, native-only plant sellers. Some of them are actually located right here in Northern Virginia and some a, a little further afield. Uh, in most years, they would also be listing uh, plant sales as they occur throughout the year. Uh, for those of you who are watching outside of, of our um, immediate Arlington, Northern Virginia area. Uh, I hope that you would turn to your respective um, master gardener units, that you should find them throughout in each county throughout your states and uh, different uh, native plant associations for the, for the states could also provide information. Any final questions, Colleen? Uh, yes, there are actually several. Um, one refers back to shrubs. Uh, when, when or if you should prune witch hazel suckers? Witch hazel suckers? I, I guess I would do that. I would probably do that in at the same time of year that I mentioned for pruning the uh, the red twig dogwood. Uh, when they're first starting to, to, to send out those suckers in the, in the early spring. That, that's when I would do that. Okay. Um, how about, are there any Echinacea cultivars that are good for wildlife? Ah, interesting topic. Um, I've mentioned this in, in some of my other presentations. It's usually best to choose the so-called straight species of a native plant. This will ensure that you are providing the, the best possible support to wildlife. Um, in, in the case of Echinacea, many of the cultivars have either uh, a changed uh, col flower color or a changed flower shape. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I'm not sure that the flower color is quite as significant. It's really that, that central cone that's so important in that particular plant. It has a very large central cone. That's the, um, the part of this composite flower that has the nectaries, the part of the plant that the, the bees, the, the butterflies, the, the surfid uh, flies are going to be going to to get the nectar and pollen that they need. With a lot of the fancy cultivars, that central portion has been greatly reduced sometimes because of a uh, very complicated flower structure, double, double blossoms. And when that's reduced, it no longer provides nectar for, uh, for the pollinators. With, uh, with some other plants, if you don't choose the, the straight species, the, the foliage color may have changed and, and that won't have the same leaf chemistry to provide food and serve as a larval host for the caterpillar stage of, of butterflies, moths, and, uh, and skippers. Another example of a plant that is absolutely gorgeous um, as far as its flowers is the Annabelle cultivar of, um, of wild hydrangea, hydrangea arborescens. It has the same huge flower clusters that the bright colored non-native hydrangeas have, the hydrangea macrophylla, the, the purples and the pinks and the, and the blues. Unfortunately, the majority of those flowers are sterile flowers. I, I mentioned this case of sterile and, and fertile flowers with the oak leaf hydrangea. The sterile flowers are beautiful, but they're not going to provide the, the pollen and the nectar for, for the insects. Okay, great. Um, someone asked about liar leaf sage and thought maybe you had a slide on it that you skipped. Uh, yes, I did. I did hurry along through that a little, a little quick, a little quickly. That um, has kind of a similar habit to the uh, the fox club beard tongue, the pen, the penstemon digitalis. Liar leaf sage is um, Salvia lirata. It uh, is in the mint family, but
but it doesn't spread in the same way. It doesn't really send out those runners. It has a very distinct uh, uh, basal rosette. Uh, it's, it's green, but it, it's kind of shot through with beautiful purple color. It will send up a flower stalk of maybe about a foot, 18 inches high. Maybe we can even, as I'm talking, maybe I can even quickly arrow back to that. And it has little uh, lavender colored, there we go, uh, lavender colored trumpet shaped flowers. And those are attractive to pollinators. It blooms for quite a long period of time from April to June. Uh, it has really interesting seed heads, a uh, very, uh, very textural interest. So you might want to keep those up. This plant, the way it, it spreads is with those uh, profuse seeds. If you would prefer that it not spread quite so widely, then you can just simply cut those back. But this, is, this shows you how there was a growth of the lyre leaf sage. And when these flower stalks are cut back and this evergreen foliage is retained, it makes quite an extensive, uh, very attractive ground cover. Purple knockout, is a very popular cultivar of lyre leaf sage. And the foliage has even more purple, uh, maroon and burgundy colors in, in that basal foliage. So thank you for pointing out my omission. <laughs> I'm okay. a little excited about sharing him. a lot of plants. Elaine, do you know if there are any native turf grasses? There are several types of grasses. If people, go to my talk on, on uh, native, native grasses and sedges and rushes. I mention some grasses that, that are uh, actually used to, in some sense, as replacements for turf grass. There are some sedges, uh, one of them plantain, excuse me, Pennsylvania sedge, that can grow quite well in dry shade where grass really wouldn't grow. That's not steppable the same way turf grass is. You wouldn't be able to, to walk frequently on it or have dogs run on it. But if you had stepping stones go through it, you could use that as a substitute for, um, for, for grass, turf grass in a shady condition. There um, is a grass that uh, is actually native to the Midwest, uh, buffalo grass, uh, Butalua dactyloides. And that one is, is being made available by some native plant nurseries and uh, can grow in a, in a range of conditions. Um, and, and that one is a much tougher grass. You, you can actually mow it to a certain extent. But the nice thing about that is you don't need to be constantly watering it. It's, it's drought tolerant. You don't need to be watering it to, to try to keep it green. You, you let it actually take on its dormant natural fall color and you can, you can let it grow a little taller. Okay, great. Um, someone asked how and when to transplant Christmas fern. Uh, well, Christmas fern ha has a nice, uh, compact root structure. Um, I tend to do most of my planting in the spring. I'll, I'll just do some figuring about what new plants I'd like to have over the winter. And then I'll, I'll, I'll make a visit to my favorite plant, uh, native plant nurseries in the spring. But I, those nurseries are still open now. And as long as the ground is, is not frozen, you should still be able to, to put them in. What you would do would be to simply dig a hole that's deep enough for that root ball and then plant it so that the, the crown, the, the point at which the, uh, the fronds begin to come up is, is right at the, at the ground surface. And, and that should do fine. You might want to, to pack that in with some uh, some compost or, or leaf mulch around that to protect it. Great, and I assume you would say the same thing for pink muley grass, it can be transplanted now? Yeah, it's, it's actually looking beautiful right now. Uh, the, those flower heads uh, form uh, and look spectacular in, in August and November. You, as I say, you wanna cite that plant really carefully because you don't want it to get bogged down with, uh, with heavy moisture in the winter, that will allow the roots to just, uh, to just rot out. Okay, and the final question, and this is a little bit out there, do you know any grasses that are good for box turtles? 
I don't know about grasses. There, there are some plant, some uh, native plants that are good for box turtles. Uh, I believe some of the sedges uh, are of interest to them, and and may apple, which has a, a, a lovely native wildflower, has beautiful uh, white flowers in the spring. And on the plants that have a, a double flowering stalk, uh, the, the may apple fruit will form, and those will provide wonderful nourishment. The, the box turtles will be excited to come and feed on those. <laughs> okay, uh, I think that does it for the questions and uh, thank you so much um, for this lovely presentation. Lots of lots of nice comments about the talk, the photos, uh, all the information and people from pretty far away. So very nice. You're welcome. I'm so excited to have been able to share this time uh, with you this morning. I hope you've uh, gained a little bit of inspiration for uh, thinking about things you might want to add to your, your garden for winter. Uh, please feel free to, to visit our website, mgnv.org, to look back at this uh, record, the recorded version of this and to look for um, additional uh, resources. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Leslie. Bye, Elaine. Thank you. <laughs>